want to just say how incredible it is to have everybody here at Pine Mountain. Um, and this is the place that I really fell in love with plants. My mom taught me from the time I was really little that I need to know the names of all the plants and um, all the trees. And she helped me learn a lot of them. And then when I came here, I came here with her a lot, and I came here in Girl Scouts. And um, when I was here in Girl Scouts, uh, Mary Rogers, who was one of the people that used to live with their husband, Bergen Rogers, um, in Big Log, which is the private residence over at the inn, she, um, she took me out and showed me her garden behind her house, and it was all these incredible, beautiful native plants that she had in her garden. And then with the Girl Scouts, she took us out to show us the, this weeping willow that um, is right at the, the um, entrance to Pine Mountain. And she told me that that weeping willow was used to make aspirin. And I was like, this is so cool. This is so neat. And then we walked up to the little um, rock shelter. I don't know if any of you all have crossed the road, but if you cross the road, there's a little rock shelter right there, really close. Um, and she talked about what archaeologists did and what archaeologists had found there and um, evidence of people living there. And I just thought, oh man, this is the neatest thing ever. Um, and so she really inspired my love of plants and also ethnobotany. Um, and so when I think back about plants, I remember coming here and thinking, there's so many more plants here than my normal walks in other places, and I wasn't sure why, but I thought, as a little girl, and I, I remember distinctly at 12 coming here, thinking one day I want to be able to name every plant here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite there yet. But, um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about Lucy Braun and her plants, most, most importantly, um, and some of the places that she really cared about and loved. Does anyone know what these pants are called? <laughs> And why did women wear them? Horseback riding. Horseback riding. Superfly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually have uh, Lucy wore a skirt a lot of times, and it was kind of like you don't want to look like a man when you wore pants, and these were a kind of a woman version of a pant. Um, I actually, there's a, a internet site that sells historic, like actual historic. Uh, the whole how to make whatever kind of clothing you want from any period of history. So I actually sewed these myself. Because <laughs> you can't buy them out of Sears catalog. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll just say a little bit about the footsteps of her is that just thinking about this place. Um, so Lucy came here and she did most of her field work here with her sister. Um, and she also drove around in a uh, Model T Ford. And I just think about how, in those, in those times, how amazing that would be to just go out with like another woman, drive around looking at plants. Um, but she inspired Mary Rogers, whose picture is up here too, um, who inspired my mom. Because my mom came here in 1963 to teach. Um, and she had she she had gone to school and they had a, pro, a program where she could um, pay back some of her school loans if she taught in a rural area like they still do and so she came here to teach and she taught many of the people that work here still so when I see people they're always telling me stories of my mom as a teacher and how she um, taught them things and uh, one of the I just have to share this one story about that which is that uh, Judy, one of the people that works here, told me that my mom really made her feel like the things that she knew about, like sewing and cooking and knitting and taking care of younger kids, were really valuable things. And she said before that she thought she wanted to know things that people in cities knew. And so it was like the first time in her life that she thought, these are important things that I know how to do. So. Um, I think about that when I teach. I want to make sure that my students realize the value of the things that they come with, you know, from their culture to the classroom. Um, yeah. So a little bit about Dr. Lucy. 
She was um, born in Cincinnati in 1889. Uh, she attended the University of Cincinnati for both her undergraduate and master's degree in geography and a PhD in botany. Um, so she went to the same school for all of her degrees. And then she taught there um, from 1917 to 1948. So that's a long time. <laughs> um, and she researched um, the rest of her life on plants. She actually researched plants um, for a really, really long time after she stopped teaching there. Uh, and she's a foremost conservationist and ecologist. She was really active as president of the Ecological Society of America and other things. And she founded the first conservation organization in Kentucky. And I think it's really important to realize that she was a woman at a time that very few women were doing this. So. Um, a little bit about like the timeline of her life. She got her bachelor's degree when she was only 21 years old, um, and her master's at 23, and her PhD at 25. Oh, wow. So I don't know if anyone else has her beat. Let me know. <laughs> um, she, and she was a teaching assistant for a few years before they hired her on as an instructor. Um, and then she had to be an instructor for several years before she was an assistant professor. Um, and then she became an associate professor, and she was an associate at the associate professor for a really long time um, before she became a professor. And actually, most of her publications she wrote in her late 50s, um, mid to late 50s. And um, one of the things that I've read about her, she said she would collect data and look at it and think about it, and she just didn't feel like she was insightful enough to write really good publications until she was in her 50s. So I'm really hoping that insight hits me. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. Um, but uh, then she started publishing enough um, to become full professor. And um, as an emeriti professor, she had three books and several publications, and she died when she was 81. But most of her prolific writing was actually when she was in her 60s and 70s. So that's pretty inspiring. Um, not that I like to compare myself. <laughs> I just thought this would give you some laughs. <laughs> I did not get my PhD at 25. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think I got her beat on my one rank. Um, I'm hoping I uh, get my next rank before I'm 57. <laughs> that is a goal of mine. <laughs> yeah. um, and one of the things that she did, which I, I think about a lot, is that she worked with the University Botany Club to raise money for a botanical preserve. So, you know, as a full-time professor, she was doing this. And what she did is she told her students to make homemade candy and to sell them to the engineering boys <laughs> <laughs> on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> so I always think about that. So my students are laughing because I'm always like, let's sell some stuff to these engineering boys. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, I think that is a pretty good idea. Um, they actually, the, she actually raised the money to buy a bunch of property in Cincinnati. It's pretty cool to think about that a professor's raising money to purchase land. Um, and so this is something one of her friends wrote about her. When I mentioned a new and delicious cookie recipe, she said, oh, I couldn't waste my time on that sort of thing. So um, she was really guarded of her time, and she was really open about how she would never do something like sew pants <laughs> <laughs> or bake cookies um, or anything like that. Uh, but she did make her students do it. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> um, and one thing that's really interesting that was uh, said about her sister is that someone um, saw her sister in 1963 and said, I just love that coat. That's just such a nice coat you're wearing. And she said, oh, I bought it in 1913. <laughs> and um, that was true of almost everything she wore, according to people that knew her and her sister. 
that if she bought something from the Sears catalog in 1910, she continued to wear it um, until, she, <laughs> until the 1960s. <laughs> Which I think is pretty impressive to think about. Um, that sort of uh, lifestyle of really spending her money on things like buying botanical preserves. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, her plants, but one thing that if you read Lucy's work, she talks about the loss of the American chestnut, and she talks about going in the woods and seeing all these dead and dying chestnut trees. And I have this picture up here of Eastern Hemlock, because I kind of feel like we're reliving that same thing, where we go in the woods and we see all these dead and dying hemlock trees. Um, if you haven't been to like Shenandoah, um, National Park or National, I mean, lots of places. Just tons and tons of dead hemlock trees. And when I think about it, I always think about one time in Cherokee when I was at Mingo Falls, I was with a Cherokee elder man and he said to me, it's not fair that our grandkids will never see what a hemlock tree looks like. And he just thought about it as like an intergenerational justice issue. And I think that that's something that we might shy away from. We always talk about the ecological value, the cultural value, but it is important to think about um, what we're leaving, our legacy we're leaving behind for our grandkids. Um, a couple things about her accomplishments, uh, 180 publications, four books, um, and 20 different, um, 20 different scientific and popular journals. One thing I think that's great is that she continued to, to publish in popular journals, which I think is an important thing for people to do. Um, and she, has a, she had the first definitive text, The Deciduous Forest of Eastern North America. If you haven't read it, I think you should. It's a great book. Um, and she had the first paper on change in flora over time, which is pretty progressive. Um, uh, four new species described to science um, and six publications on the notes of Kentucky plants and numerous range morphology and ecology papers and um, she had checklists that were used or lots of different things for a long time and 11,891 are bearing specimens that were cataloged. There were probably other ones that weren't. Does anyone here in the room have her beat? <laughs> 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 I'm like, Will's not on the side. <laughs> 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 you have more than that? Around 40. 40,000? 40, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of a good comeback. <laughs> science that I'll talk about. I'll talk about these plants just because they're pretty neat. The white hair, uh, goldenrod, bronze rock press, um, the white snake root, and the Cumberland azalea. These are all species that she described. Um, and this is the white hair goldenrod. So this is um, their herbarium specimen on that that she has. And she found it in a sandstone rock house. Um, in Menifee County. Okay. Um, and here's a picture of it. Pretty exciting. Golden rod. Pretty fun, okay. <laughs> here's some actual pictures of it. Um, and it was described in 1942. And um, Kentucky recently lost a really great photographer who took a lot of the pictures I'm going to show tonight. And that was Tom Barnes, and Tom Barnes, when I was um, 13, I took, I was at a 4-H camp, and he was like, oh, you should really learn about plants, because they're so cool, and he mentored me and worked with me, and he actually, t him and I went to Utah together, and he talked, showed me a bunch of the plants that were there in Utah, and um, his work has really helped to preserve a lot of places in Kentucky. And he has a great book that you can buy. It's called Kentucky's Last Great Places. And it's a book of all the um, natural areas that have been preserved um, 
that kind of describes them. Uh, so this is the range of the white hair going around. Okay. Pretty small area, just a couple, three counties in Kentucky. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the status of these plants and their rank. And how many people here are familiar with the Nature Serve website? Well, if you're not familiar, become familiar because um, it's natureserve.org and they have a species quick search function. And this is not just plants. This can be any kind of beetle or um, anything. <laughs> so if you're ever concerned about the status or rank or conservation um, listing of a species, this is the place to check. And I think before anyone ever goes as a botanist to a new location, it's really important to know what's greater there. So then you know what not to be collecting or what areas to maybe avoid um, disturbing. And um, the Nature Serve will list both the rank um, and the status of a plant. So they kind of have a scale here and they have maps that are color coded based on their scale. Um, and as you all might know, there can be global ranks for a plant and there can be uh, national ranks like for the United States of a plant and there can also be a state rank. And a lot of these species are particularly rare like the southern or northern parts of the range. So something like Dave, who brought us sassafras tea, there he is. Um, in the state of New York, sassafras is state listed. So if you go right now on the internet, you'll see people selling sassafras tea and sassafras roots from New York State, which they should not be doing because it's very rare up at the northern end of its range. So it's important that you know the status of your plant, especially where you are. Um, so when we look at some maps of these species, anything that's red, uh, orange, or yellow is at risk of going extinct. And there's a lot of things that go into this. Um, a lot of them are the number of populations, the number of individuals in those populations, threat risks, lots of other things like that. Um, so right now, white hail pear goldenrod is a G2, um, so it's globally imperiled, okay? So it's a species that we could potentially lose. So when I think about um, Lucy's legacy, I think about these species that are found in only a couple counties that are found in these areas like um, rock overhangs that I'm guilty myself as a teenager growing up here. Those are places where people went and partied you know, that aren't necessarily preserved from a lot of human impact. Um, so this species is in peril. Um, Lucy Braun's uh, rock cress. Um, it used to be an Erebus, but they changed the name. Well, if you want to like that, they keep changing the name of this thing. <laughs> no one from the Missouri Botanical Garden was involved in this one. <laughs> you can't go for them a hard time. Um, so, uh, another one that's found on, uh, on rocks a lot of times. So, um, And this is where it occurs. Um, and it just very disjunct range, probably because of lots of human activities. Um, and it, it is globally uh, imperiled, and it's state listed in Tennessee as critically imperiled, and in Kentucky as imperiled. Um, Lucy Braun's white snake root. Uh, and she found this in a sandstone rock house, too, near Cumberland Falls. And here it is, there's like the little rock uh, overhang, and then the white snake root kind of growing in the uh, sandy soil underneath of that. 
brought over him. What's really neat in these places in Kentucky are there are these um, glow worms that occur in there, and if you go in there at night, you can see them all glowing. Mm. <laughs> it's really beautiful. I used to do that all the time as a kid, and I take my daughter to see that a lot. Um, Pickett State Park is a state park um, that's, it's a little bit of a drive from here, but that's how everything is from here, but <laughs> it's a beautiful place that has glow worms. Um, and it was renamed in her honor. And this is the range of the Lucy Brahms White Snake Group. And it's listed globally as in need of conservation. So it's got a global ranking of G3. And in both Kentucky and Tennessee, it's listed as vulnerable. And one, one isolated population I think they found in South Carolina is listed as critically in peril. Uh, Cumberland rhododendron. Um, and the isotype of this was found at Yahoo Ridge. Isn't that beautiful? It's so gorgeous. Um, and this is the range. And these range maps are from uh, plants.usda.gov. And on a lot of them, you'll notice like in North Carolina, it just shows it green, but it doesn't show the counties where it occurs. Has anyone ever seen that on the map before? Do you know why they do that? They don't want to tell you that one county where it occurs, so you don't go there and dig it up and plant it in your yard because it's pretty rooted in there. <laughs> Um, so you'll find a lot of plants that they're worried that someone might take from the wild, they won't list the county. Um, and some states are more protective of their data than others. And North Carolina is pretty protective of a lot of their plants. But something like ginseng, a lot of times you click on the county map and it won't show you what county it occurs in. Uh, Cumberland rhododendron is listed as critically imperiled in North Carolina, therefore they don't give you the information on where it is. And um, imperiled in Alabama and vulnerable in Tennessee, Virginia, and Georgia. Um, and Lucy Braun described a few new varieties, a stiff goldenrod, another exciting goldenrod. Does anyone here love to key out golden rods as much as me? <laughs> okay. Um, and then a robin's plantain and uh, a Greek uh, valerian hybrid and a fern hybrid. And there was a there's a prairie dock named in her honor, Lucy Ron's prairie dock. Uh, so this is the stiff golden rod. This is where it occurs. And so it's found in a lot of counties in Kentucky. And um, it's listed as an apparently secure in Kentucky, um, critically imperiled in Virginia, uh, imperiled in North Carolina, and vulnerable in Georgia. And you'll notice a lot of states that don't have um, any ranking for a lot of these plants. States like Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, I'm not picking on those states. <laughs> but all, a lot of times it's because they just don't have any information. So they don't um, have the proper information to make any call on it. Um, one thing about natural heritage programs is that there are um, natural heritage programs that that include several states, like for the Tennessee Valley Authority, that include lots of states, but a lot of times they focus on states like Tennessee where there might be more rare things than other places, unfortunately. Um, so this is Lucy Brown's Robin Plantain. And um, this is Parents Family. And it's listed as apparently secure in Kentucky and West Virginia and critically imperiled in Maryland. It's known from only two sites in Maryland. 
Um, and the fern hybrid she found, um, so she has a, a, a finding on this that she found in Ohio, which was a hybrid between two species of ferns. And uh, a, a variety uh, prairie dock that she described. So um, this is the isotype of that variety. And it was found in Adams County, um, which is the county she lived in. So it's kind of neat that she was able to find this. Um, and so it's only found in that one, the only place that it occurs outside of Kentucky is in that one county right there. Um, and this is, a lot of plants um, aren't found endemic only to Kentucky just because of the shape of Kentucky. It's really easy for some of them to be right across the river or right north or south or east or west. Um, and these are her notes about finding it. Um, where she found it in 1950. And actually, if you ever are lucky enough to go to the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, they have lots of isotypes there of lots of different species, and they actually let you go look at them. <laughs> so uh, it's a great place to visit if you want to like, get a picture with one of your favorite plants. <laughs> I would recommend it. The only thing I'm happy about, the last time I included this picture in a talk, I was wearing the same outfit. I guess I have a limited wardrobe. <laughs> Even though it's embarrassing to be wearing these pants, at least I'm not wearing the same thing. I <laughs> all my pictures of myself. <laughs> um, and it's listed as vulnerable in Kentucky and not ranked in Ohio. Um, so, she rediscovered a couple species they thought were extinct, including uh, a goldenrod, and she had a lot of range expansions. Um, things that were only found in other areas that she found in new places. So, um, the, uh, the ozone calamint was found only in Nashville, and she found it in Henry County, Kentucky, in a cedar glade. Um, uh, starry rosin weed, she found in Kentucky. Uh, Canby's Mountain Lover. Anyone here heard of that plant? It's one of my favorite plants. Um, there's a rare butterfly associated with it, but I won't be able to come up with Canby's Mountain Lover off the top of my head. But um, it was used historically to attract a mate, so I really like the name. <laughs> um, and range expansion of cut leaf tooth forks. So this is the Shorts Goldenrod, and that's the location, the counties where Shorts Goldenrod is found in Kentucky. And its conservation status is critically imperiled in the wild, and it's globally, and it's ranked that in both Indiana and in Kentucky. Uh, Ozark Calumet. That's the range. Um, and it's listed as uh, in need of conservation globally, and it's in peril in Kentucky and vulnerable in Tennessee. This is the Canby's Mountain Lover. It's kind of like, I'm trying to think of something for people that are more northern, it's a little bit like very small, but it kind of looks like an American U when you first see it. I would say. That's the only thing I've ever confused it with, like a small American U, which you all don't have that far south, but <laughs> people that are more north might be used to seeing American U. Um, and this is the range of it. Very disjunct range, right along the Appalachian Mountains. And it's listed as critically imperiled in Maryland, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Tennessee, and imperiled in Kentucky, West Virginia, and Virginia. And that's all I have. My last picture is my field assistant. <laughs> Any questions?
Is there any program to expand, the, the, to grow these plants that are endangered or imperiled? Um, she said, are there any plans to grow these plants that are endangered? And, you know, that's, that's kind of a tough thing to answer. Um, in a lot of states, um, the state natural heritage program doesn't want people um, propagating endangered plants. Um, back to the place where they used to be. Yeah. And my answer, why is that? And I said, because a lot of state heritage bot botanists don't want to do a whole lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, excuse me, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> we have grown no, source goldenrod, yeah. and we went through a huge effort at growing it. It grows very easily from seed, and we put it back at the falls of the Ohio, which is the big rock outcrops in the Ohio River by Louisville, Kentucky, where, where um, Dr. Short originally found it. And then a big flood came and took all those short goldenrods somewhere down to New Orleans, and that was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs>